listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. Welcome to another edition of the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. I'm your host, Femi Abebefe. As always, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. Our producer, Andre Paraiso, in for our guy, Elliot Bowman, on the ones and twos here on this June 29th here, Michael. And we've started to see some news coming out of the NFL. I know it's kind of the slow season here, but, of course, uh, ESPN's Adam Schefter reported the news yesterday that a handful of players, including Colts corner and kick returner Isaiah Rogers, are expected to receive the season-long suspension. So this is a suspension that Calvin Ridley got a couple years ago. The season-long suspension is the NFL gambling news continues to kind of circulate the the media cycle here. Yeah, I mean, look, everybody's wants to attack the NFL for being hypocritical. How can you suspend these guys, you know, for violating the the betting laws, but then take money from betting companies? Well, look, the betting has been around. It's going to be around. It's part of our culture, and it's a good thing. However, you've got to have integrity within the game. And so I think the rules were fairly clear about what Mm -hmm. the NFL wanted to do. They're not saying you can't bet. They're giving you – rules and regulations on what to do. And clearly the players didn't pay attention to it for some reason, you know, for some reason. And I think people are being way too hard, Femi, on the NFL for for lashing down on this. Uh, Do I think a year suspension is, should it be? Probably not. But I do think, to me, the job of the commissioner is to protect the game. And he's got to do that. And if the players know the rules, you can't make an excuse for them. Yeah, that's the hard stop for me as well. It's like, these are the rules. They say you can't do this. So the whole hypocrisy thing is irrelevant as far as I'm concerned. And also, I mean, the fact that they're in bed with the gambling companies is the phrase that everybody uses since they're getting money yeah. from all the like DraftKings. I mean, hey, we're a DraftKings show as well. Like, we're in bed with the gambling companies as well. But I think the fact that just because they're it in deals with these companies – doesn't mean that they don't want to also make sure that their game is clean. Because if anything, it puts further emphasis on making the game clean. Because, hey, your partners are over here saying, hey, like we can't have anything nefarious going on. Otherwise, that p- puts us in a compromised position here. That's why the NFL is going to be like really, really focused in and dialed in and making sure that these guys aren't betting on the NFL in particular or betting whether they're on trips or in the team facilities. You know, and we have compliance training working for DraftKings. Yeah. I mean, I'm so about we to take have the to training uphold a little bit. The standard. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we have to uphold a standard on what we have to do to maintain our our practices within this. But I think what really gets lost here is people are in such a rush to attack the owners for taking money from the betting companies. When that revenue, that revenue gets put into the player pool. Mm-hmm. So it, it isn't like, okay, it isn't like they're just pocketing that money. You know, we have a we have a collective bargaining agreement, right? Mm-hmm. And so when DraftKings buys an advertisement on NBC to pay for, you know, an, an ad on their Sunday night football, that money directly goes to NBC. It doesn't necessarily go to the NFL, but it does go to the NFL through the agreement mm-hmm. of the broadcast rights. So, like, that money that you could say the owners are just grabbing and putting in their pocket is completely untrue. The money, get the distribution, the signage, all that stuff, yeah, that goes to the owners in the stadium if they own the stadium. But some of that stuff gets shared, and it's equally distributed throughout the league. So it's unfair to say the players aren't benefiting by the relationships with the, with the betting networks. Yeah, I mean, everyone's benefiting from it. I mean, like, like obviously, we, we're benefiting from it. The players are benefiting. The owners are benefiting. The coaches, like, like, like everybody, like, the, the bigger the pot gets, the more money there is to split up between the all the entities, whether it be the owners and the players and all, like, everybody else. Like, like I, I don't see this just being, like, like you mentioned, all the money that's going to, towards gambling is just going straight to the owners' pockets. That's not the case here. And I know people want to make those, like, but, fa- I mean, you know, social media is the, the, the land of false equivalencies. You know, that's the land where we do the, well, if this, then that. If this, it's like, guys, like, just take a second, breathe. The hypocrisy is irrelevant here. And it's not even a hypocrisy. It's all irrelevant. There are rules in place that the NFL said you cannot yeah. bet on sports or you, or you can bet on sports, but you have to do it outside the facility. You can never bet on the NFL. And if guys are going to bet on the NFL, like this is not a surprise. I said, oh, I didn't know. Like you already saw Calvin Ridley get suspended for a year. He's just coming back this season. If you didn't learn from then, what are you doing? 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, at some point, if you don't have rules, you don't have a structure. You don't have a foundation. And look, I, I think to me, a year might be too long. So, you know, I think that's a harsh penalty, you know, especially for Calvin Ridley, who was basically, you know, not betting a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And But, you, you know, at some point you have to – you're using the punishments to deter people from doing it again. Now, clearly that one-year suspension on Ridley didn't deter anybody. No. So we get back into the whole thing. Does you know? Does this deter other people from doing? I don't know. Education helps learn this, but I do think to me it's unfair to just basically say the NFL owners are hypocrites. They're not. They're trying to protect their game, and so if you want to call them hypocritical, that's great. But the players are benefiting from this relationship as well, and so we all have to comply. You and I comply. Mm-hmm. Coaches have to comply. Why can't the players? And as of right now, there have only been four reported year-long suspensions. So Ridley was one a couple years ago. C.J. Moore, Quintez Cephas, and Shaka Tony. That was with the Detroit Lions report that came out earlier this offseason. Those guys have been suspended for at least a year. We believe Isaiah Rogers is going to be added to that list, as well as some other players, according to all the reports. A couple of guys have been suspended only six games, that being Jamison Williams of the Detroit Lions and then Stanley Berryhill. Those guys did not bet on NFL games, but they did bet while at the team facility. So they got the six game suspension. So clearly like the biggest, biggest red flag that you can do is to bet on NFL games. If you just bet at the facility and bet on other sports, you're going to get a six game suspension, but you shouldn't even be doing that. Cause the league says, Hey, you can't do that. All it takes is just drive 600 yards down the road or 600 feet down the road. And you can place your bets. If you want to do that, if you want to put in a bet, it's for not the that NBA complicated. Finals. it's not that hard. It's not that complicated. Right. I mean, like all you gotta <laughs> do is fo- like, there's, we all have to follow rules. Mm-hmm. You know, we all have to follow the protocols of our jobs. Why can't the players? And why do we feel sorry for the players when they act stupid? Yeah. <laughs> like, stu- like, why do I'm not, I don't feel sorry for Jack Jones. I mean, he knows he can't take a gun to the airport. I mean, that's just stupidity, right? He should get punished for that. Yeah. You know, by the league's conduct penalty and by the courts of law. I mean, that's against the rules. You know that. I mean, unless you live on some without any any communication to the outside world trying to get a gun through an airport without a, a, a without the protocols being followed is going to be a felony it's just idiotic which is good for all of us yeah it, it's absolutely idiotic and like you said we all have rules like we have rules like we're not allowed to bet at DraftKings Sportsbook there's other like where I'm sitting here at Circa Resort and Casino they the, the people who work here cannot bet at this sports book they would have to go down the street at another sports book and bet they're like there's rules right. that every single one of our jobs just follow the rules and you don't have to worry about getting suspended or having to lose money uh speaking of money some guys making money Devonte Parker signed a 3 year contract with the New England Patriots an extension worth up to 33 million dollars This is a deal that gets done as Parker kind of finds his home there in New England, played there last season, but now is there for the long term, at least on the foreseeable future. You know, everybody thought Parker was going to be a cap casualty so they could sign Hopkins. I mean, look, Parker is, you know, the thing that concerns you about Parker is his durability, right? He's never played a full season, and that's a worry, right? He's a very talented player. He's not an elite speed receiver, but he's got a lot of eliteness when it comes to playing jump ball, the balls in the crowd. I mean, the guy averaged 17 yards a catch last year. I mean, the guy can make plays down the field in a 50-50 ball. He's got good hands. He's a big kid. Unfortunately, he doesn't stay healthy. But there is never was going to be the part where they're just going to get rid of Parker. Parker's got ability to play. The problem is he just doesn't do it on a consistent basis. And at $11 million a year, that's well below the market rate for what these receivers – I mean, look, that is below the market rate for receivers. Mm-hmm. And I think when you look at what they paid Smith-Schuster and you know what they wanted to pay Gusecki, I, th- I think this kind of falls in line to their salary cap. They need him to play well. They need him to be the down-the-field player along with Taquan Thornton. So to me, I never, ever, I mean, somebody wrote that, that he was going to be a cap. That, that was never going to be the case. They, they like the player. They don't like the durability of the player, but mm-hmm. they like the player. And for Parker, you know, when you can put that into a carrot and make him have to earn it down the way by being active for so many games and playing, that's going to be important to everybody. So now that they've signed Parker, does that mean that the Hopkins situation, is that done or does it make it less likely, or are they still, in some people's eyes, on track to sign Hopkins? I, I think, to me, Hopkins is always about what it's going to cost, right? Like, it, I, I can't imagine 
that they're going to sign Hopkins and, and pay him more than what they paid Smith Schuster, what they paid Parker. Mm. That's not how they operate within their cap structure. You know, they, they don't like to create the locker room. Why did you pay him and you didn't pay me? Like, you know, all those things. So mm. uh, I would say that's not likely. Could they sign Dalvin Cook? You know, I don't know if they would. It depended on the market again. You know, with New England, it's always about what's the deal and, and the player. Mm-hmm. And I think that ultimately will take time to figure out. Yeah, we'll see if Hopkins wants to sign for that deal that Parker signed for. I mean, clearly he wants the Odell money, as of what I'm assuming he Everybody would want. Everybody wants it. You want Odell money. You've been telling Bill A.D. Yeah. you want Odell money <laughs> since he got it. Hell yeah, I want Odell money. <laughs> I'm sure you do too. <laughs> He'll just blame that on me. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see what happens with DeAndre Hopkins. But we do know DeAndre, or Devontae Parker, excuse me, will be back with the New England Patriots. And uh, obviously we have about 90 seconds left here in the segment. But obviously yeah. sad news earlier this week in the National Football League, the passing of former quarterback Ryan Mallett just at the age of 35. He unfortunately yeah. drowned over in one of the Gulfs in Florida. I mean, he was a high school football coach. I mean, just a really, really unfortunate situation, Michael. Yeah, pride of Texarkana, Arkansas. His dad was a coach. You know, went to Michigan. We draft uh, New England drafted him in the third round. I really thought uh, uh, Mallet could end up being a good NFL player. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he never really kind of got it all together. He played well for Petrino at Arkansas. Had a great arm. Had great timing and rhythm. There just was something you know missing in terms of instinctive and tangibles, all that. But what a great kid! You know, what a great kid. We were the, I was there with him and always brought life to the room and, and very energetic. He had had some off the field problems, whether it was in Michigan or in high school, but he kind of seemed to got his life straight. I know that the, he was a high school coach now and really mm-hmm. enjoying it. So it's just sad. It's just way too young. And as Al Davis said, every time some young person died, I have no more tears. It's just sad. Yeah. yeah he obviously played with the New England Patriots, the Baltimore Ravens, the Houston Texans. Uh, 35 years old, he was the head coach at Whitehall High School in Arkansas and just completed his first season in 2022. So obviously our thoughts go out to the Mallet family and everybody who knew Ryan Mallet gone at the age of 35 way, way, way too soon. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more on the GM Shuffle on the other side. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. All right, Michael, you are back at it again with your columns here for VSIN.com. And your most recent column that you wrote as we do our writing spotlight here in the offseason, and it had the headline Can Sean McVay rebuild the Rams again? Obviously, he did it in 2017, and they've been wildly successful under Sean McVay's tenure, but went on some hard times for the first time a year ago, and it looks like they might be on some hard times again here in 2023. So what was the point that you wanted to get across before we get into some of the nuggets that I thought were really interesting in the article? You know, I, I look, I, I think to me, you know, the, the future is now. When, when I was growing up, uh, Lombardi left the Packers in 69, and then he died in 70, and then 71, uh, George Allen came to Washington from the Rams and started – what he did in Los Angeles when he was the head coach of the Rams, he said the future is now. We're going to win. And we're not waiting for draft picks. We're, we're going to give away picks uh, for veteran players to win now. And 72, they went to the Super Bowl and lost to Miami, undefeated Miami team 14-7. to And, you know, and then in 77, it had kind of sputtered out and died. And he got fired and went to the Rams and then got fired again. He's a Hall of Fame coach because uh, – you know, he's, he had a great win percentage, but he was 2-5 and five in playoff games and only went to one Super Bowl. Kind of, in my new book, he doesn't qualify. But what I wrote about was the Rams starting that Future Is Now program again. And at some point, you know, you got to pay the piper when you give away all your draft picks. And I think Les Snead apolog- like, took back that comment that he made after mm. the draft, you know, and <laughs> and – because, look, they were rewarded with a title, and there's no one that can take that title away. And they were fortunate. There's no question about that. You know, the false start, that, that not called, you know, the horrible third and one. I mean, whatever it is. But the trophy exists, and they earned it, and they deserved it. But now they got to pay the price for it. And to me, until you really get your fingers into the dough, I don't think you realize how far down they're going to go before they can rise back up again. 
And I think it's really challenging because what I wrote about Femi, the premise was they've won with elite talent and high cap numbers and a lot of minimum players. Now those elite players, with the exception of Donald, are, are maybe not as elite as they once were, and they still are in that unproven talent element have to play. And I think it's going to be a really hard year for them. And you really put the example out there about Matthew Stafford, about how they tried to trade Matthew Stafford earlier this offseason, the $59 million that they – like nobody wanted to take on Matthew Stafford because I think we're all kind of sort of scared about what's his durability like going forward, 35 years old. And the fact that Stafford is now back, you think that's going to kind of further hamper this rebuild or this teardown for the Rams? Well, they had no choice, right? They, they couldn't get anybody to t- – I mean, if they deny that they were trying to move him, then it's negligence on their part. Like, it, it would be complete negligence. Like, it would make – why are we bringing him back? Like, he, mm-hmm. it's 50, he won a title for us. We're, somebody should take the fifth. No, but they couldn't get anybody to take the deal. They couldn't get anybody to take the deal, so they had to do it. So they dug a deeper hole. That deeper hole might end up getting them Caleb Williams for that matter. I don't know. But to me, they have they, – the highest draft pick they've had under Sean McVay, as I wrote about, was this year at 36. His first year was the highest year pick they had, which was 42, which was Gerald Everett. But for the most part, they've been picking in the 50s, 60s. One year they had the 107th pick. Like, <laughs> so it's hard to procure talent. You know, when you don't have a lot of picks and you don't have any high picks, when you're constantly always taking what's ever left to you, the crumbs, and it's a challenge. And no matter how great of a coach McVay is as an offensive innovator and all that, it's really challenging. I mean, last year, if you just study Stafford and watch the tape of Stafford and you watch him against good defenses, Dallas and San Francisco twice, they struggled. They struggled mightily because the pressure, his eye level's down. He's been hit way too much in his career, and that's hard to rejuvenate. That's hard to rekindle again. And so for me, I think this ship's going to continue to go further down before it can rise back. And look, Les Snead loves Stetson Bennett coming out. I've been told reliably that that he was all over Bennett. He thinks Bennett can be a great player. And he may be right. I don't know. Again, I'm not criticizing draft picks because everybody's entitled to an opinion. I don't see what he sees in Stetson Bennett. I see a program player. Maybe he'll end up being Brock Purdy. I don't know. But to me, until they fix the quarterback, it's going to be hard to fix everything else. Toward the end of your column, you wrote this interesting line here. Now, this is the one that really, like, my eyes not popped out of my head, but they widened. You said, what would help the Rams is for them to develop the unproven talent, allow Stetson Bennett to show his skills, maybe he could be the next Brock Purdy, and secure a top five pick. So, are you suggesting that maybe we should, maybe midway through the season, or maybe after four games or so, Make Stetson Bennett QB1 to just kind of play that out and get evaluation on him and then ultimately decide what to do after the season ends. I, I think I think Stafford's gonna kind of take it. Look, Stafford's got a back injury, he's got, you know, elbow injury. You know, it's he, and he's gonna take his hits. I mean, it's not gonna be an easy game for him. He's gonna get hit again and again. Eventually, will he stay durable? Boy, that I think it's remarkable. Now, look, no one's gonna question Matthew Stafford's toughness. Certainly no. not me. Nope. But he's going to get hit, and Bennett's probably going to have to play at some point. My bigger question then, if they do that, is what do they do with Aaron Donald? Mm -hmm. Like, he's really the only asset that they have that's worth a lot. I mean, Cooper Cup's a really good player, but Cooper Cup's coming off a second knee injury. You know, he averaged 10.2 yards a catch last year. You know, everybody in the league knows he's getting the ball, so it's kind of be – I know Von Jefferson's there and all that, but – you know, he you could take him out of the game, but the only asset that they have that's worth substantial is Donald. Donald, do they trade Donald and get a bunch of picks back? Because the the longer they wait on that, Donald gets older, and he may decide he wants to retire. Remember, he almost wanted to retire once. Yeah, he was hinting at it before they even won the Super Bowl. There was talks about, hey, this could be Aaron Donald's last game. That kind of caught us off guard right there, the pregame show on the Super Bowl. But you mentioned Donald. Like, I don't think he would want to be around for a rebuild. I don't know Aaron Donald. I'm just guessing. But he's a player that probably still feels like he's in the prime of his career. Does he want to be a part yeah. of a teardown? And when uh, I, Oh, sorry. You want to say something? No, no. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, when I look at their schedule, I mean, they start the year at Seattle, you host the Rams, or sorry, you host the, the 49ers, you're at the Bengals, at the Colts, host the Eagles, host the Cardinals, host the Steelers, at the Cowboys, at the Packers. So those first nine weeks, if they're three and six or so and we're coming up on that trade deadline, I feel like that's a t- time for them to start becoming sellers and selling off some of those pieces to acquire some sort of draft capital. 
I, I, that's the point of my column is at some point when you realize that this, when you gave Stafford the 59 million, you had to know this is going to be a really hard rebuild and you couldn't trade him. Now, again, uh, once again, this is all framed around, we won a Super Bowl and you mm-hmm. deserve to take your bows. Yep. But what you did wasn't sustainable. It's what I wrote. That's why I led the column with George Allen. Because by 77, Allen was out of Washington, and there was tremendous repair. Jack Pardee came in. Their team was horrible. And it wasn't until Joe Gibbs came in 81 that they kind of got it back going again. And so I think to me, at some point, someone's got to sit there and say, okay, here's where we are. I was surprised Sean came back, not because I didn't think Sean wanted to keep coaching. I just think this is a monumental rebuild. This isn't a remodel. We're just not going to take the bathrooms out, you know, and or put new carpet up. This is we're going to have to take it to the studs here a little bit because we've had no draft picks. And you're asking a lot of these coaches to be really developmental coaches. And that's good, but at some point in the fourth quarter, you need players to make plays, and that's a hard thing. And you're going down a 30 you're going down if this, if the Rams were an NBA team, everybody would say, and they should tank. <laughs> but in the NFL, you know, nobody, nobody really thinks that because you know they got Stafford. Stafford really is should be on the cap just because it's too much cap debt to carry if they cut him. But the reality of it is, is he's if he tries to keep winning games, it's only going to hurt their rebuild. You know, it's uh, McVay. We've never seen him have to be like that developmental head coach. So we're going to probably see a different side of Sean McVay this season here. But the fact that they were able to hang the banner, get the ring and win the championship. Do you think that we'll see other teams kind of develop this mantra of the F them picks? I know it's not sustainable, but it did help them win the Lombardi trophy, which is what we do this for. I think there's a there's a point. I mean, they went all in. Yeah. From the start. I mean, they went in with golf. They went all in with golf. They went all in. You know, they've wasted a ton of money. I mean, if you look at their at what the contracts that they no longer bred, it's Brandon Cooks, Todd Gurley, Jared Goff. I mean, they, I mean, most owners would have fired anybody doing that money. But I guess Cronky, you know, I mean, he understood why they did it and he was bought in. Mm hmm. But to me, I, I just don't think anybody else will go down that reckless money path again. I mean, they spent a lot of money. You know, they spent, they've been to two Super Bowls. They won one, lost one. And, you know, look, the San Francisco might have gone to that one Super Bowl if, if, uh, what was it? If, if what's his face catches the ball. Yeah, on the Tart. interception. Yep. Yeah. It's like so, a pop fly. Look, they were fortunate. There's no, qu- and they earned it. I, and I'm not taking anything away. But from a team building standpoint, when you study this team from a team building, they have a, almost 40 guys that are rookies and one year player. They have almost 40 guys that came from their system. So, like, that's really – that's there's just not enough. And when you take away the draft picks and you go all – I mean, it's one thing to go all in like the Jets are doing with Rodgers, mm-hmm. right? They're not – they're distributing their – they're going to hurt their future a little bit, not to the degree that the Rams have. That's <clears> my <throat> point. Well, I think it's, it's really interesting because you probably need the backing of ownership for sure. To, to go ahead and do this. You know, it's like, like you mentioned, I'm uh, sorry, uh, uh, like you need the backing of ownership. Like Stan Kroenke was saying, all right, guys, yeah. if, if this is what you need to go ahead and get this done, I'm fully behind it. Because if you don't have that backing, there's no possible way to do this because not every owner is going to want to be paying all this money and, and structuring the contracts the way that they structured to sort of kick the can down the road, knowing that eventually the bill is going to come due. Not every owner kind of sees that vision and wants to sort of buy into that. But Kroenke, I mean, I don't know if it's because he's dabbled in all sorts of different sports as an owner and then maybe he just thinks about things differently but kudos to him in that front office like they were fully bought in and they got their super bowl now it's the credit card bills a little bit due right and and i think look everybody's going to go i mean tampa bay's in the same situation right they've gone cash over cap to win a title deservingly so when you go cash over cap i mean there was the one year jacksonville just fell short of going to the super bowl they were extremely cash over cap Mm mm-hmm and when you do that, then you can't keep going cash over cap. At some point, you got to stop. And then the owner gets the money. You know, he ends up balancing his books. But to me, this is going to be a really and, – and, and I don't know how bad the Rams are. I mean, the Rams are going to be using a lot of survivor pools a bet against them because are they going to be good enough? The Cardinals and the Rams are the two teams. Yep. If you're looking for a team to play in Survivor, play against them. Yeah, I think you can throw Tampa into that group as well. <laughs> the Buccaneers and the, the roster that they kind of have going over there 
in Florida. So that's what we have for the survivor pools, and that's what we have for the Los Angeles Rams. On the other side, Michael, I want to spend about five minutes or so before we wrap up the pod talking about training camp because now we can celebrate. We have training camp dates, light at the end of the tunnel. Football will be here before we know it. Let's take a quick break, though. This is the GM Shuffle. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. Oh, baby. We have training camp dates set, Michael Lombardi. It is a time to smile, a time to be happy. On July 25th, all 32 teams, rookies, veterans, will have reported to training camp, and the season will officially be underway. My... It's 26 days, man. Like, like what happened to the offseason? It's just 26 no days away, man. And we'll be back to football. That fresh cut grass that you wait. talk about, man. We're about to be smelling it soon. I love it. Yeah, I love it. it you know, and then you get on the routine. There's nothing like the, uh, the, the, the NFL season routine. You know, you just get going. You know what Monday is. You know what Tuesday mm-hmm. is. It's really kind of fun. So I love it, you know, and yeah, you enjoy the enjoy the Fourth of July. Enjoy your visit up to the lake and yeah. kind of get caught up on the. You know, we haven't had this discussion. Are you? <laughs> where are you on the Sopranos? We are early season five, but this week with, oh, no, with nothing going you on, snagged, you you slowed down. We we slowed down a little bit. I'll, I'll admit we did slow down a little bit. Um, but with this week now, because a lot been going on, doing stuff with the travel stuff and trying to get everything ready to go for the visit and all that stuff and the wedding planning and all that. Like I mean, we just met with the wedding planner yesterday and stuff. It's just oh boy, yeah, the, the, the caterer. Where's and this the and wedding going to be held? Where uh, will your wedding be held? It'll be here in Las Vegas. It'll be nice. here. Yeah, we we figured we'd do it because I'm from Seattle, she's from Minnesota, so we figured we'd do a neutral site, bring both families here to Las Vegas. And uh, make it That's a neutral awesome. side thing. So uh, I think everyone's excited. I know all our friends are like, they've been asking us, hey, where's the wedding? And when we say Vegas, their eyes light up. <laughs> They're just like, oh, nice. We get a nice little vacation. So I think everyone's my, my excited. Son told, my son told me the busiest weekend in Las Vegas, or the busiest is like the 4th of July, I guess all because of Summer League, yep. 4th of July. Like it's really busy around this time. I, I would have never thought that in Vegas with all the heat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 4th of July. People love coming out here. I wouldn't have thought it too because it's, it's going to be like 110 next week so uh, I'm, I'm luckily we're getting away from that i'm gonna be right by the water dip my, my dip my feet into the water you know dip the whole body into the water it'll be nice to cool off and then when we come back we'll probably be greeted by 109 degree weather so uh, i'll have that to look forward to but summer league's coming up here in about a week or so people are very excited a good time it's, it's always a good time to be in vegas you know there's always a lot going on in this area but training camp though is on the horizon we're excited for that and obviously it's been a little bit weird with, I don't know, Michael, if you've been kind of keeping tabs on what's going on here with the HBO, NFL films, and these NFL teams as it pertains to hard knocks. I don't, I can't remember the last time that we've gone this far into the summer without knowing which team officially would yeah. be the hard knocks team. Now, reportedly, it sounds like it's going to be the New York Jets. They're of the four teams, I believe the Commanders, the Jets, the Bears, and then the Saints are the four teams that the NFL could force to do it because they don't meet the qualifications to be able to opt out. They haven't made the playoffs in the last couple of years. They don't have a first-year head coach. So the, those are the four teams that they could actually force to do it. It sounds like the Jets might be that team, and they're going to go kicking and screaming because they want no parts of this because they already know that the offseason is going to be pretty chaotic and the hype around Rodgers and, and everything in New York is already coming here. So it doesn't sound like they want to do it, but the league might just say, hey, you got to do it. They have to. The league's got to do that. I mean, yeah. look, it, it, I, I mean, would the Saints be interesting? I don't know. Derek Carr for four weeks, uh, that would be tough, right? <laughs> Did you see his latest comments? <laughs> I saw him. I mean, like, it, it never stops. <laughs> Like it never stops, you know. Like it just go play, go play, like go play. Um, uh, the, the Bears. I mean, you would love that. You could snooze up. You could snuggle up to Justin Fields the whole time and just you know watch yeah. him. Uh, See the progression. And then the, you can't do the Commanders because I mean, to me, the, with the new ownership hasn't been approved, so you almost can't do that. Yeah, it's got to be the Jets. It's I gotta. mean, the only other team it could be is the Bears because you know there's so much buzz that you have promoted for your boy Justin Fields and about those last five games. I mean, those last five ta- game tapes are really like the Zabruder tape. I mean, they've been analyzed and put through, and you know, it's just really amazing. You know. It's unbelievable. I watched an incredible video on YouTube the other day about the mm-hmm. uh, the killing of Officer J.D. Tibbet, and it was so well done, and the facts were just blatantly right there. But the the whole the whole Zabruder tape and the killing of Tippett, it's just it's like every once you get a narrative going, man, it's hard to stop. 
<laughs> so you're blaming me for this national narrative? <laughs> oh, there's no doubt. You're the you're the spokesman for it. I mean, you are the Danny Thomas to St. Jude's for the Justin Fields thing. That's what you are. You are. <laughs> And I've learned now to calm myself down. I don't get mm-hmm. upset. I just have accepted it. I've moved on. I've done the Rick Rubin program of of relaxing about it. I'm good with it. It's it's the summertime. We don't want to get upset. <laughs> you know, we're all just going to have a good time here. But it's just, I, I think that the Jets have to be the team for hard knocks. But my thing with this is that I, I'm a little disheartened by the teams that don't want to do it. I get like, hey, like, all right, this is another thing that we have to add to our plate or whatever because we're trying to get training camp done. But I mean, the hard knocks and everything that comes with the league, this is why everybody makes so much money. There's so much interest. The fans want to see the behind the scenes. They want to yeah. get involved. In the, but, like, but it's, Femi, it exposes people, too. I mean, like Herm Edwards came out of that not looking very good. When he and Dick Curl sitting there deciding whether Damon Hurd's going to be their starting quarterback. I mean, the fans watch their coach and say, mm-hmm. wait a minute, that ain't very good. I mean, how did Hugh Jackson look? I mean, the only guy that looked <laughs> half decent in the, in the whole Browns thing was Freddie Kitchen, and we know how that turned out. Right. So like when you let them in, you better be really good. And you're not letting them. They're not getting a full view of it. Like there's such on the periphery of it all that, Mm -hmm. you know, look, that that's the thing that drives me crazy is we have this thirst for knowledge about the NFL and what goes on behind the scenes. Yep. And then the worldwide leader and these other they don't cover it from that point. You know, like there's this appetite for this. And then when we get we talk about the games, we don't have anybody that talks about the games through the lens of hard knocks, the strategy, what goes into it, how it's worked out, what they're trying to do on the field, all that. You would think that, okay, people really want this hard knock stuff and it's great. So don't they want it on Sunday too? But we don't get that. Yeah. I mean, we, we don't get that. And I, I don't know if it's because we don't have the people qualified to speak on those things or – or, or maybe the people that are directing the ship, the the directors, the producers, or whatever. I don't. I, who knows why why we don't get that? But we but we don't. And, and well, they say they'll say to you, nobody wants to talk, nobody wants to talk the details, X's and O's. And I couldn't agree more. Like I don't think everybody, nobody wants to know what sloop coverage is. Nobody really wants to know what what the you know the 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 protection is. They but they want to understand. They want to get involved in the strategy of it all. Mm-hmm. They want to understand what goes on. Door. That's what Hard Knocks is about. It takes you inside to the strategy of team building. It takes you inside to the strategy of, of how to prepare the team and who's the opponent and what's going on and the competitions that are going on and the decision-making between player A and player B and who's going to do that. that that's what they want. And I think sometimes coaches are scared to go through this because it might expose them as lack of leadership. It might expose them of not being in command. Mm. Yeah, no, that, it definitely could expose some folks, but whether it exposes them or not, I mean, it's interesting television. I don't know if you're a fan of Hard Knocks or watch it anymore. Um, I, I don't watch it as much. I watched last season with the Detroit Lions because I think Dan Campbell is just an interesting character. I did not and, watch last year. <laughs> you didn't watch last season. You gotta, it's on I watched. H- I think I watched a couple. Max. Like I yeah. watched parts of it, but like when Tate Frazier and I did the pod, we would kind of. It was Hugh Jackson. It was like it was like was reality TV. That you know, so that that was like, and you could look at it like coaches bringing their phones to staff meetings. Like, are you you know like come on, man. Yeah, that, that Cleveland Browns one was was definitely something. I mean, like my all-time favorite one, and I'm sure a lot of people out there love this one. Like the, when Rex Ryan, the New York Jets, that 2010 season entering into then that that was from an entertainment standpoint because you had all the stars, you had the Revis contract stuff going on, Rex being Rex, like that was just got entertaining. Mike Tannenbaum driving his car, yeah, that was always, that was really good. I enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah. it was fun. But, but but you don't really get that behind the scenes stuff anymore. It's more so just like the human interest side of things, which I get that there's an audience for that. But as a football junkie, I'm more so like I want to know like 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 why did they decide to cut this guy or why did they like like what do they think about. They're linebackers to this end. We want to keep six of them instead of seven. We want to keep this instead of that. Like, I think that aspect of putting a roster together, I think, is really interesting. But, I mean, I don't think the teams really want to show that. Um, so it makes it kind of a tough deal for, for HBO and NFL films to kind of – because the teams get the final say on the, on the edit. So that's what kind of right. makes it a little bit difficult. But the Jets would be fascinating. I mean, oh, yeah. because we could see, you know, Salah. We could see Joe Douglas. We could see Woody Johnson's impact. You know, we could see Nathaniel Hackett's, you know, and then mm-hmm. we've got Aaron Rodgers, you know, and how this all comes together. I think it would be fascinating. Yeah, because we never got – because the Packers would always make the playoffs when they had Rodgers. So we never got to see the Packers on hard knocks. Now this is a chance for us to see 
one of the most recognizable and players in the NFL. why aren't the Packers qualified? Why aren't the Packers on the list for hard knocks? Because uh, they made the playoffs two years ago. So it's you had to have oh, made okay. the playoffs within the f- two years. That's why we never see the Patriots because they always make yeah. the damn playoffs. But if they don't make it this year, they'll be eligible next season for hard knocks. And that, I'm DVR and Michael. <laughs> that, that, that's the one that we all want to see. You say that it'll never happen, but if they don't make the playoffs this year, I'm, I'll, I will write a letter to Roger Goodell and the damn NFL and say, hey, you have to pick the New England Patriots. Otherwise, I'll riot. And do you sign, do you sign that letter, the chairman of the Justin Fields MVP <laughs> board? Is that how you sign your letters? <laughs> I'll sign that one in blood. <laughs> that's the, I'll sign, I'll sign that one in blood. I mean, I mean, who so wouldn't want who wouldn't want to see that a uh, hard knocks New England Patriots? I mean, that's people would be absolutely people would be absolutely stunned. All the critics of Belichick would be absolutely stunned about what actually he does every single day. People would be stunned, which would make for you excellent know, television. Would, oh, I mean, it would be it's a it's a tutorial on how to be a head coach. It really is. It would be a class that they would teach at, at any university on how to be a head coach. Yeah, and it should be taught. I mean, it's like you know, uh, you certainly you the only way you learn how to be a head coach is be around a head coach that understands that role. Mm-hmm. Like I, I'm not sure that we have that going on in the league right now in terms of a leadership standpoint. But for me, I think that's what it would teach. It would be a class in leadership on how to be a head coach. Yeah, I, I, that's they've never been eligible because they've always been making the playoffs. They don't go two years without making the playoffs. And stuff, so that's why we've never seen the New England Patriots on Hard Knocks. But man, it, it, that might be one where Belichick goes kicking and screaming. He might not want to open the doors <laughs> for the HBO crews to get on in there for uh, for Hard Knocks to see what's going on over in Foxborough. But that would be a lot of fun. We think it's going to be the Jets. I'm sure that's going to be really entertaining. Your boy Robert Sala is going to be running the stadium stairs, doing oh, the push ups. Yeah. He's going to be, you know, just, watch it, it, him play golf. He loves playing golf. I'm sure he played 18 today. That's hit, awesome. Hitting 350 off the tee. You know, we're going to get all that stuff going on later on next month whenever Hard Knocks officially announces that it'll be the New York Jets. But that does it for this edition of the podcast. Hopefully, everybody has a great weekend. Thank you to our producer, Andre Paraiso, filling in for our buddy, Elliot Bowman. Elliot's got another week of vacation, so Elliot will be back. Coming up in a couple weeks, he will be back on the other thing, but Andre will be holding things down until then. Thank you to DraftKings. Thank you to VEASAN. Thank you to you, Michael. I will talk to you on Monday. Thank you. <laughs>